And uh, without further uh, details, and without further uh, discussion, I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. David Mason. Thank you, Paul, very much. And uh, I, I, uh, if you were uh, taking notes and making uh, notes, I want to protest that I'm a bolt rather than a nut. <laughs> well done. Uh, well, thank you for having me here this evening. I want to thank, first of all, Father Niehoff, the president of the U university. But I want to thank also uh, Sheila McGinn and the Theology and Religious Studies faculty, and Kathy Murkar, the administrative assistant, for issuing the invitation uh, to give this to a lecture. As was indicated, in 1966, uh, the Walter and Mary Tui established the Tui Chair of Interreligious Studies. Some of you present have been to many of the Tui lectures. In 1966, they established the Tui Lectures of Interreligious Studies, and now the second generation of Tuis has continued to support this program and I want to publicly thank them as well. And I think it's not inappropriate here at this time uh, to thank the parishioners of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Cleveland Heights, at least for whom many, all of the homilies that go into making up this book, God of Love and God of Reason, uh, were, were given and also many of the lectures that are in that. And uh, uh, this being the case, I would like to read a passage from a homily that is in the book, but I gave in uh, early December of 2009. That was, of course, uh, in the beginning of the Advent season and the homily was about hope. And I said, I have frequently talked about this idea of God that I was talking about. In fact, I said, my dearest, most beloved critic says, you always only want to preach about God. <laughs> and I probably should plead guilty to that charge with the caveat that I occasionally mention the Browns, the Indians, and even the Cavaliers, but they give us no reason to hope. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Go Cavs. Go try. And perhaps I shouldn't say go Browns because they might leave town, but <laughs> <laughs> but yes, go Cavs, go Tribe, go Browns. Well, now into the talk. Christian fundamentalists and the new atheists, are they enemies or frenemies? They're biblical literalists both, who both miss the mark. In God of Love and God of Reason, I marshal several arguments that are designed to show that belief in God is not unreasonable. And at the same time, I present and develop a number of ideas of God that are reasonable, as well as being in tune with the fundamental biblical ideas and images of God. To be sure, I take issue with the new atheists who argue incessantly that the question of the existence of God is a matter for scientists to determine and that science shows that God does not exist. Moreover, that religion poisons everything. 
Now, given this, you might suppose that I would align myself with the so-called Christian fundamentalists, who also, of course, oppose new atheism. I do not. Nor do most mainline Christians, Protestants and Catholics, although you would never know this from the daily press or from the talk shows such as Real Time with Bill Maher. I oppose the Christian fundamentalists every bit as much as I oppose the new atheists. And in fact, I believe that the two, fundamentalists and atheists, often share the same presuppositions and that put them in league with one another and bind them together in a network of misconceptions and mutual recrimination. So in the title of this talk, I suggest that the two might be considered frenemies rather than sheer enemies. What do I mean? Well, in, in, in this case, a frenemy is one who pretends to be an enemy, but is actually an ally. Wikipedia tells us that a frenemy can refer either to an enemy pretending to be a friend, or to someone who really is an ally under the skin, so to speak, but also a rival. And the Urban Dictionary tells us that a frenemy is someone who is both friend and enemy, bound together in a relationship that is both mutually beneficial or dependent while being competitive. They are fraught with risk and mistrust. And so this is why I have employed the delicious imagery of Lewis Carroll in uh, Behind the Looking Glass, uh, the imagery of Tweedledum and Tweedledee. <laughs> The twins, and, 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 and you must go back and read at least that chapter. Uh, uh, the twins who would fight until six and then have dinner, but hit everything within reach, whether they could see it or not. Now, let me explain my thinking about Carol's imagery of the twins, Tweedledum and Tweedledee, as it applies in our case. The fundamentalists and the new atheists are themselves twins, I hold, in that each regards God as a very superior being, like us, whose existence can be found or disproved by empirical means. I want to uh, stress that. Uh, oh. Empirical means. That is to say, by examining the evidence from the world around us. The one twin has a literal reading of the Bible, which it believes to be factual history, descriptive of ordinary lives and events. And it declares that God this very superior being who can yet perform natural miracles, created the world in six days, then created a man out of dirt and the divine breath, after which God created the man's wife from his side and then walked about the garden in the cool of the day. Innumerable other such miracles abound in the Hebrew scriptures, uh, including, for example, Elijah raising a child from the dead and then Elijah ascending into the heavens rather than dying. And there are innumerable other such miracles. But let us proceed to the New Testament where God causes a virgin to conceive and give birth to a son without the aid of a human father. And this child is called a son of God. And the son of God walks on water, raises several people from the dead, and does many other miracles. And this son of God, named Jesus, actually then gets put to death. 
actually dies. But God brings the Son of God back from death to life, after which he ascends into the clouds of heaven for which he is, from which he is expected to return to bring about God's reign on earth. And all of this is believed quite literally by the fundamentalists and is used to beat little minds into submission. But what about the other twin, the modern day atheists? This twin too presupposes the same sort of reading of scripture and the very same sort of God, were there only such a thing. A very superior being like us in every way, only with supreme power to override the laws of nature and to do impossible things. Yet of course, this being is decisively disproved, the atheist says, by empirical means. The innumerable mistakes in the so-called divine plan, the human atrocities, the very many bad things that occur daily without the intervention of a good God presents negative evidence that that is to say, evidence that such a God does not and could not exist. As Sam Harris, one of them says, the biblical God is a fiction like Zeus and the thousands of other dead gods whom most sane humans can now ignore. And this twin too lashes out and slashes about hitting everything within sight. You see, both twins, the Christian fundamentalist and the new atheist, make the same assumption about God as a being like us in every way whose existence and activity are proved or disproved by science and about the way of reading scripture as either a scientific text or as history. Now, has this state of affairs uh, always been such? Has there always been a fight between science and religion? Is it inevitable that there be a warfare of science with theology in Christendom? That's the name of a book that came out in the late 19th century. I don't think so. I think that we have here a clash between the increasingly liberal theology of the 19th century and a counter argument, a revolt against the increasing use of reason and the historical method when examining scripture. Fundamentalists claimed to be a return to ancient truths, but fundamentalism is really a retrenchment for fear that the historical method in examining the Bible was a matter of caving into secularism. So in a series of tracts published between 1910 and 1915, they set forth what they took to be the fundamentals. Uh, these are fundamental truths, they say, and we should pay attention to them. The first is the verbal inerrancy of scripture. Verbal inerrancy. of scripture. The second is the divinity of Jesus. The third is the virgin birth. The fourth is something that's I don't even understand. Uh, the substitutionary theory of the atonement. <laughs> and the fifth is the bodily resurrection and ascension 
of Jesus and his expected return in glory to reign. We can uh, all of this, as I say, taken quite literally. Uh, now, what is striking to me is, of course, the insistence in the first of these that scripture is to be taken word for word, literally, as direct verbal dictation from God. And this, with this weapon, the fundamentalist launched an attack upon all fair and objective historical investigation of the Bible that dedicated scholars had been engaged in for at least a century then. Now, one of the first significant results of this new warfare on the prevailing theology was to insist in various state legislatures on denying the teaching of evolution. In Tennessee, the legislature passed the Butler Act, which prohibited the teaching of evolution in the schools. And in 1925, John Scopes was brought to trial for that very thing. Most of us, I think, are familiar with the trial, perhaps through the play or the movie, Inherit the Wind. And we might be forgiven for thinking that the conflict of the Bible and evolution was laid to rest there. Laid to rest because Clarence Darrow we saw in the movie. Uh, uh, Clarence Darrow, the agnostic lawyer for the defense, showed again and again that William Jennings Bryan's literal reading of the Bible was riddled with holes. It shows clearly that the Bible is not a reliable scientific text. Therefore, we might suppose that evolution could be taught in the schools and that the fundamentalist modernist controversy was settled in favor of the modernist. But we neglect the fact that Scopes was convicted and that the Butler Act was kept intact until 1967. Fundamentalism had won in the courts and in the hearts and minds of many very conservative Christians. During much of the 20th century, fundamentalism and liberal modernism then grew side by side within Christianity, each side being, I suspect, very hardly aware of the other. Thus it was, for instance, that in the late 1940s and in the early 1950s, I, as a young teenager, learned at the hands of a seminarian from the Virginia Theological Seminary, who had at the time was working at our little Episcopal church in Kaiser, West Virginia, I learned at his hand what I had heard from my parents, uh, that the theory of evolution by natural selection with random variations was fully compatible with belief in God as talked about in the Bible and as decisively revealed in and through Jesus Christ. And I became convinced that it was important to my spiritual growth to promote the genuine scientific theory and observation as explanatory of the natural world, and at the same time, to think, think deeply about God and religion. I sensed the truth that Whitehead had written in the year of the Scopes trial. Religion will not regain its old power until it faces change in the same spirit as does science. Although at that point in my life, I had not heard of Whitehead. Some of you present might think that I 
herd of whitehead at my mother's breast, but <laughs> uh, I, I learned later. In fact, when I was a sophomore in high school, the story goes on a bit. When I was a sophomore in high school, I took the required biology course, but I began to suspect that the teacher who stuck to descriptions of plants and a few animals was never going to broach the topic of evolution. This is a biology teacher. And so I, frankly, not so very innocently, I asked her, Miss B, I remember her name, Miss, I'll call her Miss B, when are we going to talk about evolution? <laughs> Even so, I was unprepared for the severity and the absoluteness of her reply. David, you must never believe that. Evolution is the work of the devil. <coughs> Evolution is the work of the devil. Okay, so evidently, evidently, Miss B was more captured by fundamentalism than she was set free by science or by mainline Christianity. It was a wake-up call for me, but I suspect that most mainline Christian preachers and leaders simply ignored the spread and growth of fundamentalism. Meanwhile, fundamentalism was promoting various pseudo-scientific, but really retrogressive religious notions, such as creationism and intelligent design, as alternatives to the scientific theory of evolution. Two of the more prominent cases that came to public attention uh, brought fundamentalism and mainline Christianity allied with science in the conflict in the courts. There were a number of court cases, but I refer to two of them. Uh, the 1982 case, the Reverend Bill McLean at all plaintiffs versus the Arkansas Board of Education at all defendants. And the 2005 case, Tammy Kitzmiller at all versus the Dover uh, public school district of Pennsylvania defendants. Back to the first one. In 1981, Governor Frank White of Arkansas, I pause here, the previous governor had been a man we know of, Bill Clinton. Uh, Frank White defeated him uh, and uh, signed into law an act to require balanced treatment of creation science and evolution science in public schools. But this was quickly challenged by a number of citizens contending that this act, Act 590 of Arkansas, constituted an establishment of religion prohibited by the Constitution. And in fact, the act was overturned and the state was enjoined from implementing in any matter, manner Act 590. And among the other things that the judge determined was that creation science is simply not science. The essential characteristics of science he found were that it is guided by natural <coughs> law, it has to be explanatory by reference to natural law. It is testable against the empirical world. Its conclusions are tentative. That is not necessarily the final word. And it is falsifiable. And so uh, the so-called creation science or creationism failed to meet these standards and was declared to be a stealth religion that depended upon supernatural intervention. 
What you need to see here, I think, is, however, is that fundamentalism, as entailing a literal interpretation of the biblical text as inerrant, does not represent all religion, certainly not mainstream Christianity. It is rather a certain type of religion, I would call it a false religion or superstition, with an idolatrous theology. Uh, I want you to see, moreover, that the major plaintiffs in the case were representatives of mainline Christian churches. Uh, the individual plaintiffs included not only Reverend Bill McLean, but the resident <coughs> Arkansas bishops of the United Methodist, the Episcopal, the Roman Catholic, and the African Methodist Episcopal churches, and the principal official of the Presbyterian churches in Arkansas. And there were uh, other Methodist, Southern Baptist, and Presbyterian clergy representative, as well as a biology teacher, yes, uh, and, and the other, uh, and the leading scholar to testify on behalf of the plaintiffs was himself a liberal Protestant theologian, Langdon Gilkey, actually my dissertation director, uh, the, the son of a liberal Baptist minister. And among the organizational plaintiffs were a number of Jewish groups. Uh, it is clear from this case alone that fundamentalism, with its belief in the literal inerrancy of Scripture, does not represent all Christian beliefs, certainly not a reasonable Christianity. And a similar scenario was played out in the much publicized 2005 case, Tammy Kitts Miller et al. versus the public, Dover Public School District. Here the case was brought uh, before uh, because a public school district had required the teaching of intelligent design uh, an alternative as an alternative to evolutionary theory with of pandas and people to be used as a reference book. The plaintiffs argued successfully uh, that intelligent design was a form of creationism. In fact, the judge referred back to the Arkansas case. And so Judge John Jones ruled against the school board, saying that intelligent design is creationism by another name. We find that the secular purposes claimed by the board amount to a pretext for the board's real purpose, which was to promote religion in public school classrooms. Now, Judge Jones' ruling provoked TV evangelist Pat Robertson to warn that the town was invoking the wrath of God. Uh, in this case, the plaintiffs, again, were parents of the students. Some of them, at least, I don't know all, some of them were members of mainline religions. I think it is also significant that the uh, two chief witnesses brought forth by the plaintiffs to testify were Roman Catholic academics, Kenneth Miller, a cell, cell biologist and a professor of biology at Brown University, whom I met when he came to speak at John Carroll, and John Haught, professor of theology at Georgetown University, and uh, the author of a number of books. Uh, among which are God after Darwin. Now, my conviction is that creationism and intelligent design are not only not science, they are also false religion and or bad theology. They treat God as if God were a natural entity acting in the world in special ways, uh, yet ways that are natural efficient causes that are susceptible to empirical verification or falsification. And this, too, is a species of idolatry. Paul Tillich put it definitively, I think, when he wrote, the presupposition of such literalism, that is, biblical literalism or fundamentalism, is that God is a being acting in time and space, dwelling in a special place, 
affecting the course of events and being affected by them like any other being in the universe. Literalism deprives God of his ultimacy and, religiously speaking, of his majesty. It draws God down to the level of that which is not ultimate, to the finite and conditional. In the last analysis, it is not rational criticism of the myth which is decisive, but the inner religious criticism. Faith, if it takes its symbols literally, becomes idolatrous. It calls something ultimately ultimate which is less than ultimate. Genuine faith, conscious of the symbolic character of its symbols, gives God the honor to his name. Uh, so I just want to write up here, faith, if it takes its symbols literally, is idolatrous. This is Tillich. Faith, if it takes its symbols literally, is idolatrous. That's pretty much what I'm arguing here. Now, if it is true that fundamentalism is a form of biblical literalism that draws God down to the level of the finite and conditional, and so treats God as a finite being to be determined by empirical tests, then fundamentalism is indeed a false religion. It has made some this worldly object, something finite and conditional, to be its God, rather than the ultimate reality that all true religion worships. This is idolatry rather than true religion. It is superstition. It is idolatry. It is false religion. And so Tweedledum, the twin that is fundamentalism, lashes out against mainline Christianity, against rational religion, and against reasonable worship. Surely, however, superstition or idolatry is not a charge that can be brought against the new atheists, since they are convinced that there is no such thing as God, and they have proof of this fact. But what kind of proof do they have? What is the assumption about God in all reality that they work from? Let us examine the assumption and the arguments of these persons, particularly Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and Christopher Hitchens. These are, there, there are m many others, but these are three of the big, big names in what I'm calling the new atheism that, uh, that ginned up in the uh, first decade of the 21st century, and is going strong still. The new atheists claim that God is a fiction or a delusion, that science, utilizing the empirical method, shows to be false. God turns out on the basis of empirical investigation, mind you, to be not a fact, but a fiction. <coughs> the product of the primitive imagination. Dawkins, for instance, asserts that the God hypothesis is that there exists a huge superhuman, supernatural intelligence who designed and created the universe and everything in it, including us, and that the presence or absence of a creative superintelligence is unequivocally a scientific question. Put otherwise as he does, God's existence or non-existence is a scientific fact about the universe, discoverable in principle, if not in fact. Sam Harris, for his part, demands that believers must present evidence of God's existence, evidence of the sort 
that only natural science could verify or falsify, and he asserts that the claims that religion makes are intrinsically in conflict with the claims of science, because they're claims made on terrible evidence. And Christopher Hitchens tries to trumpet his own scientific uh, sophistication by reporting on a number of scientific reports that he had read and appealing to Karl Popper's thesis uh, that a theory must be falsifiable to be a legitimate scientific theory. Uh, thus, all, clear, all clearly think that the God question is one to be adjudicated by natural science. Moreover, they show their hand when they bristle at the conviction expressed by legitimate scientists. Uh, by the way, I, I, I understand that, that Dawkins is a legitimate scientist. I don't mean to say that he's not. Uh, but he's operating in this context, not as a scientist, but as a, uh, as a philosopher. Uh, that science cannot arbitrate the fundamental questions that religion endeavors to answer, questions that Peter Medawar, himself a Nobel Prize winning scientist, said, are questions that science cannot answer and that no conceivable advance of science could empower it to answer. Dawkins, for instance, rejects out of hand the a thesis of Stephen Jay Gould, another scientist, uh, about called NOMA, the non-overlapping magisteria of science and religion. They're non-overlapping, he says. The magisterium of science covers the empirical realm, what the universe is made of, fact, and how it works this way, theory. The magisterium of religion extends over the questions of ultimate meaning and moral value, Gould says. And in response to this, Dawkins, refusing to concede or even to get his point, fumes. I simply do not believe that Gould could possibly have meant much of what he wrote. Does Gould really want to cede to religion the right to tell us what is good and what is bad? The fact that it has nothing else to contribute to human wisdom is no reason to hand over to religion free license to tell us what to do. <laughs> Dawkins' assumption that all religion, here, his, his assumption that all religion is both stupid and mean-spirited reminds me very much of the fundamentalist belief that all biblical texts are the words of God and are inerrant. Uh, uh, they, they're on the opposite sides, but, but they're absolute claims. And this is a blustering cover for Dawkins' unwillingness to accept that there are questions of ultimate meaning beyond the reach of science, questions that only religion and philosophy can address. Sam Harris, who also called gold a quizzling, for his Noma statement, it shows the same sort of blind and angry resistance to a statement by the National Academy of Science. Uh, <clears throat> this is the National Academy of Science writing. At the root of the apparent conflict between some religions and evolution is a misunderstanding of the critical difference between religious and scientific ways of knowing. Religion and science answer different questions about the world, whether there is a purpose to the universe or a purpose for human existence, are not questions for science. Religious and scientific ways of knowing have played and will continue to play significant roles in human history. Science is a way of knowing about the world. It is limited to explaining the natural world through natural causes. Science can say nothing about the supernatural. Whether God exists or not is a question about which science is neutral. So I should write that on the board, but this is a statement by the National Academy of Science. 
Science can say nothing about the supernatural. Whether God exists or not is a question about which science is neutral. Harris is, if possible, even more resistant than Dawkins to accept the insight that there is a legitimate religious way of knowing, one that raises and answers questions that science can say nothing about. Questions about the supernatural, whether God exists or not, and what could be the nature of the divine. And so, rather than address the issue directly, or confront the matter of whether religions, religion and science address different kinds of questions, Harris simply launches an attack on the National Academy of Science for what he calls its stunning lack of candor. He suggests that the NAS was making this clear statement, not honestly, but duplicitously, for fear of losing public funding out of raw terror for the, of, for, for the tax-paying mob. Once again, refused to get the point, <clears throat> even to countenance the idea that science and religion raise and address different kinds of questions about the universe, and that religion is a legitimate way of knowing, and cover this attack by, by cover this by attacking the integrity of the scientists who do in fact get the point. The point here is that there is a more to the universe than that which science, natural science, can and does empirically investigate. Uh, just want to write that simple word up here, more I'll leave it at that, more to the universe than that which science uh, can investigate. Uh, that more is something that Whitehead said, again in this 1925 book, something that stands beyond, behind, and within the passing flux of immediate things, something which is real, yet waiting to be realized, something which is a remote possibility, and yet the greatest of present facts, something which gives meaning to all that passes, yet eludes apprehension, something whose possession is the final good and yet is beyond all reach, something which is the ultimate ideal and the hopeless quest. Apart from the religious vision, he went on to say, human life is a flash of occasional enjoyments, lighting up a mass of pain and misery, a bagatelle of transient experience. The new atheists simply refuse to grasp the idea that religion stands for and that a great many scientists understand Namely, that there is a more to reality than that which can be empirically verified or falsified. More, that is, than the physical universe that science properly does investigate. And so this twin, too, this twin Tweedledee, attacks not only religion, but also the scientists who understand that there are questions that religion and philosophy address that science cannot address. Tweedledee, like Tweedledum, lashes out at anything that threatens its little world. And in this case, the world is one in which the imperial majesty of science is to be blindly obeyed. But Tweedledee is no more a friend of science or of reason than Tweedledum is a friend of religion and reason. By regarding God as something whose existence or non-existence is a scientific fact about the universe, an object among other finite objects, the new atheists have committed what Tillich said was the besetting sin of fundamentalism. They have dragged God down to the level of the finite and conditional, thus depriving God of his ultimacy. They have endeavored to insist that God not be God. Moreover, 
Moreover, we should be clear that by defining all reality in the way they do, by defining all reality as that which natural science investigates, by insisting that material reality exhausts all reality, they have eliminated from the very outset anything that can properly be meant by God. Thus, no God is built into the assumption that all reality is finite, material reality, that can be known empirically. By assuming the natural world exhausts all reality, the new atheists have already concluded that there is nothing more, nothing supernatural, nothing transcendent. There is no God. But you can see at once that this is not a reasonable argument. It is what we call begging the question. That is, assuming the conclusion in your fundamental foundational premise. Tweedledum, Christian fundamentalism, is, I have argued, no friend of science, no friend of reason, no friend of mainstream religion. Tweedledee, the new atheism, is, it seems clear to me, no friend of any religion, true or false, no friend of the legitimate aspiration of science, and no friend of reason. So the two may well be frenemies, but neither is a friend of reason or of religion. Thank you very much. Now, do we have time for a question? Yeah, we do have time for questions. Uh, or, or, Kathy is going to or, or, a uh, portable microphone. It's already down to the right. And we are glad to take some questions from the audience. Uh, or, or questions or challenges. Challenges. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Uh, Dr. Mason, near as I can figure, Roman Catholic thinkers don't have an awful lot of use for process categories. And a lot of them have written it off. Um, I can name on, only a handful of people in the Catholic tradition who, who even deal with those categories. Uh, that saddens me, of course, because I'm a process thinker. Um, do you think there's anything in process thought that uh, is going to cause it to be a period piece? Or do you think it's just kind of waiting for the right time to... <laughs> well, I, I uh, have to say that I have never been uh, good at predicting uh, the future. Uh, not even good at analyzing the present. Uh, I, I, I really don't know. Uh, it, may, it may fade out. Uh, there are, by the way, a few uh, Catholic thinkers that I know of who take uh, process thought seriously. Of course, uh, Joe Bracken is one. He's a Jesuit. Uh, and, uh, and to say, this is just an aside. We had Joe Bracken here as a TUI lecturer uh, a number of years ago. I, I brought him in. and. Uh, I think uh, Joe Bracken has used Whitehead and process thought to uh, uh, unpack the doctrine of the Trinity. And I think Joe Bracken is just way off base there. <laughs> I think he's utterly foolish in what he says about it. But he is a very smart Catholic thinker who takes process thought seriously, as does John Hott. Uh, uh, who, who has utilized it a good bit, at least in God after Darwin. Uh, and and uh, uh, David Tracy, who some of us know and love and find him not understandable very much, but is a brilliant, brilliant uh, person, has utilized uh, some forms of process thought. So, I, I don't know. 
it 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 may die out, and, but I'll probably die before it does. So, hey. Uh, many years ago, I took a course on the Geiger Prize by Maimonides. It was very perplexing, but I do remember this: that Maimonides said God's word in the Bible is true, but God gave us, but God's world out there through the window is is true, and God gave us a brain to think and eyes to see. So there can be no conflict. So if we think there's a conflict, we need to interpret scripture differently, maybe by allegory. But we can reconcile the two. He was the scientist also about the yeah. Jew. So I just wondered about your thoughts. Well, uh, admittedly, I don't know Maimonides well at all. But, but you're right, there are, there are any number of uh, great medieval thinkers who, who take this Tech. And, and of course, uh, most of them, uh, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, uh, utilized the allegorical method for interpreting a lot of, uh, of, of the basic scriptures. And I think uh, some of the Muslims did this with regard to the Quran. Uh, and I think that's a way, that's a way it's not uh, 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 it's not my way, but it's a way of saying, yes, we can get hold of some deep, some deep truths here that, uh, uh, that are not what is literally apparent on, on, on the surface. So I, I think so. Um, you haven't mentioned the concept of revelation. And I wonder how you would think about that in terms of how Christians think about some of the fundamental beliefs that you put on the board. It seems that there's a difference between revelation and belief based on empirical evidence. How do you think through the claim that some of these things were revealed by God? Well, I don't think that uh, the, the literal kinds of things that I mentioned uh, uh, were revealed by God. I think these were stories written by humans. Now, I think there is uh, revelation, uh, but it, it comes powerfully through uh, uh, the deeper Things that happen, I think there's revelation. Say in in uh, the the uh, the Exodus event, and I think there's revelation uh, coming through the prophets, uh, and I think there's revelation uh, revealing uh, God's love for the world coming through the life and ministry uh, of Jesus of Nazareth. Very powerfully so. But I don't think that, uh, uh, that uh, divine revelation is revelation of particular claims about, say, miracles or facts of that sort. Am I anywhere close to your concern? Yeah. Too many times, uh, Bill. <laughs> and I'd like to have you tell us whether you think that God is really a human construct with each human constructing her or his concept of what God is. And in that, you have these 
what I'll call fringe non-religions, idolatry or atheism, are part of that construct spectrum. I, 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 I'm not sure what the last part you're talking about is, whether the, uh, say, the, uh, the uh, say, well, it's Christian fundamentalists and new atheists are uh, also part of the construct, or what, what? Are part of the human construct of how uh, people are trying to define their meaning in life. In Hinduism or Buddhism, we have a whole different structure of, 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 of the faith in terms of many gods or many manifestations of, of, of God, Shiva, Pakrati, if you will. Um, and in Hinduism, there's a plethora of interpretations of those. And some of those in Hinduism are, are uh, quite fundamental and literal. Oh. And yet, they are still on that whole spectrum of determining for each individual um, their relationship to a uh, higher being or higher beings, if you will. Well, uh, I... I, I I won't get into Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, anything, because I don't know very much about it. But, uh, you know, I've, I've read what, uh, what many have to say. But all I'm saying here is that uh, if, let us, let us look at some fundamental uh, deep, deep beliefs and let us examine them and, and understand what they're saying. And, and here then I would go on to say uh, that if, if we, uh, we want to say, well, what is God after all? Uh, we start with some, some ideas and some of them are not bad. For instance, uh, God is the greatest conceivable reality. And, and, and go on with that. God is that being which cannot fail to exist. Now, right there is a, there is a hard thing to get your head around, but it's something to be serious about and to argue about. And uh, if one does that, one can have something to talk about uh, and, and uh, perhaps uh, beyond all the many human constructs of the divine and the, and, and the Eastern constructs of the divine, maybe there is a, a one beyond the many. Uh, and what, what is this all about? And this, this I'm saying, is what we call God. Uh, and and uh, then I think, I think you can take seriously uh, some, some images and ideas about this being. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, I, I play around with uh, many that some of which I, I think are are true to the what I think is the biblical picture of God. Uh, some some have developed uh, later than the biblical uh, witness originally, but but I think are still. Uh, 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 true to it, uh, and and uh, I think it's really worth looking at those things, uh, those ideas and images, 
And, uh, uh, and you know, I'm not going to try to lay them out here. Many have done it, but, uh, but uh, they're, they're all to be taken seriously, uh, uh, argued about uh, reasonably, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and let them inform us. Uh, none of them, I think, are things that can be, as I say, disproved empirically. Of course, they can't be proved empirically either. That's, but, but we're talking about being reasonable about this. All right, well, thank you very much. I can't make the big work. But yes, uh, I think we'll call it an evening with that. Thank you. And someone, um, thank you very much.